God bless you, everyone. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I have a message from the Lord today. We're going to begin reading at the very end of that chapter in verse 26. While you're finding your way to Galatians 3, I want to invite uh, Pastor Jason to just come back. Uh, we're going to share a song with you. Our friends says, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Jesus Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Paul is talking there about water baptism. I want to just say a word about water baptism. We have a water baptism service next Sunday afternoon, a week from today. It's up in Norwalk at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. If you have not been baptized in water since you became a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm not going to tell you to pray about it. I'm just going to tell you to do it. You know, if it's in the Word and the Word says to do it, you don't have to pray about doing it. You might have to pray that God helps you do it, but you just have to do it. And so the, Paul wrote these words in such a way because to him, there was no such thing as an unbaptized believer. An unbaptized Christian was something, there was no category in his mind for that because in the New Testament, whenever people became believers in Christ, they immediately received water baptism by immersion. I was baptized as a baby. You might have been baptized as a baby. And that was significant in, to the extent that it was an expression of faith on the part of your parents. But when you have come to faith, you need to be baptized in water. Jesus said so. And so uh, go out to the Welcome Center. Sign up and join us next Sunday afternoon for water baptism. All right, jump to Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, what I am saying <clears throat> is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were enslaved under the principles of the world. But when the appointed time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us from under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And because you are a son, you are also an heir through God. We have a song we want to share with you. Thank you, Pastor Jason. You might know it. If you know it, sing along with it. He knows my name. And I have a maker. And he forms my heart. And hears me when I call And hears me when I call Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Father, I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, worship team. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. I have a message from the Lord today for the brokenhearted. I have a message for the fatherless. I have the message for anyone who never knew the love of your earthly father. For anyone who was abandoned by your earthly father, abused by your father, neglected, failed, hurt, disappointed. For anyone who had a strained relationship with your father. The word is, you have a father. I have a message today for anyone who's raising kids without a father. For any woman who's going it alone. Who wishes there was someone to talk to to help her. For any woman who hurts for her daughter. For any woman who doesn't know to do, what to do with her son. For any grandparents who hurt for your grandchildren. Your kids have a father. To all the dads going it alone 
You have a father who will show you what to do. I have a message today for anyone who's missing your father. If you're missing his affection, if you're missing his protection, if you're missing his watch care, his concern, if you're missing his company, if you're missing his jokes, you have a father. You have a father who is good. You have a father who is kind. You have a father who's patient. You have a father who cares, who's available, who's interested and engaged, who's a good listener and a good communicator. You have a father who's infinitely intelligent, emotionally mature, profoundly wise. You have a father who's a good leader, who's strong and capable, disciplined and diligent, always consistent, ultimately dependable. You have a father who's a good provider. You have a father who's a good role model. You have a father who's a good teacher, a good guide, a good disciplinarian. You have a father who is enduringly handsome. Some might even say beautiful. You have a father who is epically talented. You have a father who is wildly successful. Yeah, you should see his ride. It drives like a cloud. You have a father who's widely respected and highly acclaimed. You have a father who loves you more than life itself. You have a father who wanted you and who still wants you. You're the apple of his eye. In fact, he never takes his eye off of you. You're the object of his affection. You bring him infinite joy. He sings jubilant songs over you. You are engraved on the palm of his hand. You have a father who is everything your heart could ever wish for in a father. And even more, happy Father's Day, you have a father. Right now, we're reading Paul's letter to the believers in the region of Galatia. That's modern-day Turkey. But this is no ordinary letter. It's a letter from heaven inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak across the ages to you and to me. We've come to this section of the letter where Paul is talking about several interwoven spiritual experiences that come not by our religious efforts, but come by faith. You see, faith in Jesus Christ is the doorway to God. Faith is the doorway to salvation. It's the means by which we lay hold of salvation. Faith is the doorway to the kingdom of heaven. It's the doorway to all the riches of God in Jesus Christ. Faith is the doorway to eternal life. When we have that moment of being convinced deep inside about Jesus, when we have that moment of surrendering our will, surrendering our life to Jesus, a whole new world of spiritual experiences opens up to us. One experience that comes by faith is union with Christ. Talked about it two weeks ago. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Another experience that comes by faith is with the Holy Spirit. Talked about it last week. Two experiences of the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit and the overflowing Spirit. So let's talk about yet another experience that comes by faith. Adoption as sons. You are all sons of God through Jesus Christ. Now, ladies, don't get offended that I'm calling you a son today, all right? Because Revelation calls me a bride. So if I can be a bride, you can be a son. There's no male nor female in Christ. Paul uses the word son because Jesus was God's son and because only sons could receive an inheritance in his day. So for today, all right, you're a son. You're a female son. We saw how faith brings us into relationship with Jesus Christ. We saw how faith brings us into relationship with the Holy Spirit. So let's look today at how faith brings us into a relationship with the Father himself. By faith, I am now in Christ, God's unique son. 
I have been buried with Christ. I have been raised with Christ. Christ lives in me. My life is hidden in Christ. In some way that exceeds my little brain's ability to understand, I have become enfolded into Christ. And because he is the son of God, I am now a son of God by association. We talked about how in Christ we are innocent by association. I am also in Christ now a son of God by association. Looking at Paul's words here in Galatians 3 and 4, I see four things that adoption does for us, and I want to share them with you quickly on this Father's Day. Four things that adoption does for us. First of all, adoption enables us to see our Father through mature eyes. Adoption enables us to see our Father through mature eyes. You know, nothing has helped me appreciate my own Father more than adulthood, and particularly fatherhood. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I was a child, I evaluated my dad based on my own childish perceptions and priorities. Did my dad spend time with me? Did he play with me? Did he talk with me? Yes, he did. Was my dad patient with me? Was he forbearing with me? Eh, not so much. But, you know, even at 48, I can still get on the nerves. Did my dad buy me the $2 plastic toy that I couldn't live without? No, never. <laughs> I have to tell you, my parents were old school. We didn't even ask for frivolous trinkets when we were out in stores because the answer was no. You know, we could use a little more no these days. You know that? Teach our kids a little self-discipline, the value of hard work, value of a dollar. In my childish way, I might be mad at my dad for not buying me the $2 plastic toy, but, you know, I couldn't see the whole big picture back then. I didn't appreciate how, ha how hard my dad worked to keep a roof over our heads. I didn't appreciate how he got up early on winter mornings to shovel the cars out and then leave for, because back in those days, you see, even though it snowed, you had to still go to work and be there early. So I, I didn't get how he got up early and shoveled the cars out and, and left early so he could be there on time through the snow. I, I didn't appreciate how he earned his master's degree at night working full time and raising two children and how he earned his PhD degree working at night, working full time. And, and raising three kids. I, I didn't appreciate how we managed our family resources so that there would be food to eat and clothes to wear and money for family vacations and money for college and weddings and first homes and money for the grandkids. I didn't appreciate all he sacrificed, all he gave, all he did until I grew up. You know, maybe we should pause right here and just thank our dads for everything they do, for how hard they work for us and all the sacrifices. Oh, come on, give our dads a good hand this morning. Among the immature, among the uninitiated to faith in Christ, God the Father suffers from a bit of an image problem. Some people see him as austere, severe. Some people see him as angry, vindictive. Some people see him as aloof, disengaged. Some people see him as irrelevant. Some people see the Father as unjust. People say, God, how can you allow so much human suffering in the world? And God says, yeah, funny, I'm planning on asking you the same question someday. Some people relate to God the Father on the basis of a broken relationship with their own earthly father. Some people relate to the Father on the basis of past religious experience. You know, some people regard God the Father as the bad cop and Jesus the Son as the good cop. But you know, that couldn't be more wrong about God and about Jesus. 
It underestimates the love of the Father. It also underestimates the righteousness of the Son, who is the righteous judge of the whole earth. Paul says adoption is a coming of age. Adoption is both a moment and a process by which we leave the childish mindset about God that belonged to life before Christ and we move on to maturity. We no longer need the law to hold our hand, to keep us in check. We no longer need guardians and trustees. We can see clearly now. Adoption helps us to see the true nature of our Father. Paul says you are no longer a slave but a son. And since you are a son, an heir, and all this, he says, is through God. You see, adoption helps us to see the whole big picture, that this whole thing was the Father's doing. God has acted in human history to bring about this so great salvation of which we have become recipients. It was all the Father's plan and the Father's doing. The call, the covenant with Abraham, that was the Father's doing. The law mediated by Moses to be a temporary guardian until Jesus came, that was the Father's doing. The incarnation of Jesus Christ, God the Son became a man and came to earth, that was the Father's doing. At the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The cross of Jesus Christ, that was the Father's doing to redeem those of us who were under the law. Adoption was all the Father's doing so that we might receive the adoption as sons and become heirs through God. You see, adoption is completely because of the love of the Father. Completely his initiative, completely his benevolence, his kindness, his grace. I was reading a story the other day about a father who adopted two boys, brothers, from Ethiopia. And he said this, he said, adoption is intensive, extensive, and expensive. <laughs> you know, adoption takes a lot of work. Adoption takes a long time, it takes a lot of patience, and it costs a lot of money. You know, that's just like your salvation. It was intensive, it was extensive, and it was expensive. Think about it, if you would. It takes the vigorous effort of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Three of them working overtime just to save one of you. It took a long time, centuries, for God's great plan to unfold in human history. And it cost God everything he had. The blood of his son, Jesus, the spotless lamb of God. You know, when you realize that, when you think about that, it fundamentally changes your perception of the Father. You realize that you have a Father who's good. You have a Father who cares. You have a Father who wanted you so desperately that he paid everything he had to have you. You have a Father who loves you with an everlasting love. Happy Father's Day, you have a father. Four things adoption as sons does for us. The second thing is this, adoption changes our hearts. Adoption changes our hearts. Not only did God send his son, but Paul says God also sent the spirit of his son, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts. Talked about it last week, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul tells us specifically here where the Holy Spirit resides within us. It is in our heart. You know, the heart stands for the whole of your inner man. Actually, the heart is the place inside of you where your body, your soul, and your spirit intersect. The heart is the innermost part of your being that is even deeper than your conscious mind, whose contents only God knows. 
From your heart springs all sorts of desires and motives and attitudes and decisions and behaviors. Your thoughts are shaped by the contents of your heart. Jesus said your words flow from the contents of your heart. Your decisions are formed from the contents of your heart. Everything you are, everything you do, it all flows from your heart. And this is the place that the Holy Spirit invades, the heart. And when he comes into the heart, he changes it. He changes the hostile heart. He changes the defensive heart. He changes the anxious heart. He changes the proud heart, the self-reliant heart. He changes the selfish heart. He changes the hedonistic heart. He changes the greedy heart. He changes Zacchaeus' greedy heart. He changes the angry heart. He changes the bitter heart, the vengeful heart. He changes the unloved heart, the self-loathing heart. Listen, he heals the orphaned heart. Some people say because they had a strained or broken relationship with their earthly dad, they say, you know, I just can't relate to the heavenly father, but I want to tell you now you can because God sent the spirit of his son into your heart to give you that connection with your heavenly father. He heals the broken heart. Because the Holy Spirit has changed your heart, you're a different person now. You're a new creation now. You're a new man. You're a new woman. Your old way of living, your old way of thinking, your old perceptions and prejudices and priorities, they're gone now. Old things have passed away and all things are become new. And because the Holy Spirit has changed your heart, you're done with religion now. Jesus said, it's written in the prophets, they shall be taught by God. See, you don't need the law anymore. You don't need the external pressure of religion to keep you on the straight and narrow anymore. You don't need religious rituals anymore. They do not bring you any closer to God, nor will they make you any more like him. You don't need to live under the pressure to perform anymore. You don't need to live in anxiety over whether you've remembered it all and you've done it all correctly anymore. Oh, not because faith in Christ means anything goes now. No, no. But because the Holy Spirit is guiding you from within, from inside your heart. The Holy Spirit helps you remember everything Jesus said. That doesn't mean that you can remember all the words of the gospel line for line, word for word. What it means is the Holy Spirit gives you on-the-spot wisdom and on-the-spot inclination to act in a manner consistent with Jesus. The Holy Spirit writes God's law on your heart so that you instinctively know what God wants you to do and you have the desire to do that too. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. Listen, I will put my spirit in you and I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A little further on in the letter of Galatians, Paul calls this the law of Christ. You see, we now follow a law, not that it was written on stone tablets or written on pages, but we follow a law that is written on our heart. Four things that adoption as sons of God does for us. The third thing is this. Adoption gives us the same connectedness with the Father that Jesus had. You doing all right this morning? Get you a little something, a little lemonade, anything for iced tea, a little break. All right. Adoption gives us the same connectedness with the Father that Jesus had. The secret to the earthly ministry of Jesus was his connection to the Father. The secret to Jesus' gracious, anointed, captivating words 
the secret to Jesus' prophetic ministry, the secret to Jesus' healing, the secret to Jesus' authority over people and over demons and over nature was his connection with his Father. The Roman centurion of all people understood that. He said, Jesus, I recognize who you are. I am a man under authority, and I have people under my authority. He said, I recognize that you stand in a place of special authority under the Father, and I recognize that you have angelic armies in authority under you. All you need to do is speak the word and dispatch one of them, and my servant will be healed. Nicodemus understood that. He said, teacher, we know you come from God because no one could do the things you do unless God was with him. Peter understood that. He wrote, you've heard how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God was with him. Jesus was always in communion with the Father. He was always in the presence of the Father. He was always attuned to the Father's will moment by moment. You see, here's proof positive that God is not the bad cop and Jesus is not the good cop. Everything that Jesus did, he did at the behest of the Father. Jesus said, I do nothing on my own. I say only what I hear my father saying. I do only what I see my father doing. So the beautiful words of Jesus were the words of the father. Jesus said, I'm telling you what I heard in my father's presence. The beautiful works of Jesus were the works of the father. The Jesus' compassion was the father's compassion. Jesus' mercy was the father's mercy. When Jesus lifted up a woman caught in the sin of adultery and he said, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. The father was lifting up that woman and saying, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. When Jesus sat beside a broken woman at a well who had had a revolving door of failed relationships in her life and her life was a mess, the mercy that Jesus showed her was the Father's mercy. Jesus' service was the Father's service. Jesus' love was the Father's love. Adoption means that we now have that same connection with the Father that Jesus had. Adoption means that God is with us, just like he was with Jesus. Adoption means that we can commune with the Father, just like Jesus. Adoption means that we can be attuned to the will of the Father moment by moment. We can hear and see what the Father wants to say and do for people, just like Jesus did. That's how Jesus could say to us. He who believes in me, the works that you've seen me do, he shall do. And what did he say? And even greater than these. By faith, you are in Christ the Son. So you too have become a son. And so you are becoming like the Son on earth. Four things that adoption as sons of God does for us. Finally this, and this one is my favorite. Adoption enables us to pray like Jesus. We used to sing a little ditty back in the day. Maybe you remember it. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will pray like David prayed. Do you remember it? It's catchy, right? But you know, there's something even better than that. Actually, what Paul says in Galatians chapter 4 is when the Spirit of the Lord moves in your heart, you will pray like Jesus prayed. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. When the appointed time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem us from under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons and because you are sons God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba Father question for you 
Why would Paul, writing a Greek letter to an exclusively Greek audience, drop the Aramaic word Abba into his letter without translating it? Imagine if I sent you an email and I called you in Ukrainian, that's my wife's family language. Imagine if I called you a kapusta and I didn't translate it. You wouldn't know I just called you a cabbage head. Don't ask me how I know that. Aramaic was the native language of Jesus. And Abba was Jesus' unique way of addressing his father in prayer. Before Jesus, no one ever addressed God as Abba. No one would have ever dared. Abba, Daddy, it was the son's exclusive address of connectedness and affection with his father. But then Jesus invited us to pray to God, calling him our Father. And when the spirit of the Son, when the spirit of adoption enters into our hearts, he generates a cry to the Father using the same address as Jesus with the same effect. Let me share three things quickly with you about Abba and then we're done. Three things very quickly about Abba. Abba. Worship team, you can come and help me. First of all, this. Abba is a cry of informal intimacy. It's a cry of informal intimacy. Abba is a family word. Abba is something that you use around the house. It's not really a word that's appropriate for outsiders. In our family, like yours, we have all kinds of little pet names that express our affection and our connection to one another. Denise and I have pet names for our kids. Denise and I have pet names for one another. We won't go there, but Kapusta <laughs> comes into it. <laughs> we even have terms of endearment for our parents. My kids called Denise's dad, Papa. So we started calling him Papa. Even my mother-in-law calls him Papa now. And somewhere along the line, I'm not sure when, I think it might have been when we were in the Berenstein Bear stage, somehow it became Papa Bear. It's affectionate. It also points to his position as the head of our sloth. A sloth is a pack of bears. So one night the telephone rang. And I saw that it was an Ontario area code on the caller ID. And Denise's dad is the only one who ever calls us from Ontario. So I answered the phone, hello, Papa Bear. <laughs> only it wasn't Papa Bear. <laughs> it was Dan McCauley calling from Ontario. <laughs> and he said, what? <laughs> I was so embarrassed. You know, that, that kind of affectionate talk, it belongs just to our family. It belongs just in our house. You know, that's like Abba. It's a term of endearment that expresses our affection, that expresses our intimate connection to our Father. It belongs only to God's family. It belongs only to God's house. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use Abba in public. Jesus used it in public. But what it means is that only we can use it. It's natural for us. It's normal for us. It feels right. But for unbelievers, it's the most foreign thing in the world. It's funny how some people struggle to address God as if they're trying to impress him, as if they're trying to ingratiate themselves reminds me of an episode. If you go back this far, you remember All in the Family? It reminds me of this episode where Archie Bunker decided he was going to write a letter to the President of the United States. So he went upstairs to his bedroom and he put on a suit and a tie to sit at his kitchen table because he was writing to the President of the United States. And of course, his anti-establishment hippie son-in-law meathead had something to say about that. 
But you know, some people are just like that when they try to address God. They're all formal and religious. Eternal God. How do they make God like a 20-syllable word, right? Omnipotent God. Almighty Creator, King of the universe. You know, they only use language that describes God's transcendence because there's no intimacy there. But we have a family bond with our Father. In Christ, we are sons and heirs by faith. And God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. And we cry out to Him with a cry that is informal and intimate. And the Father turns His ear to us just like He turned His ear to Jesus. Jesus said, I thank you, Father, that you always hear me. Can I tell you, if you are in Christ, the Father, he always hears you. Second thing about Abba. Abba is a cry of childlike trust. Abba is the language of babies and toddlers comes from the most basic syllables of Aramaic. Ah, ba, 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 ba. In English, our little babies, they say, da, 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 ma, 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 ma. It's the same thing. Interesting fact. Do you know that as early as three or four days after birth, babies develop their own unique cry melody that matches the language and the speech patterns of their parents? Linguists have studied this phenomenon all around the world and they've discovered that babies immediately after birth, they begin to match their cry to the sounds of their own parents' voices. You know, maybe that's why a mother is uniquely tuned in to the cry of her own baby. Do you know that a mother can hear even the very faint cry of her own baby from very far distances? Do you know that a mother can distinguish the cry of her baby in a whole room full of crying babies? You know, you ought to try that out. You ought to sign up for the nursery. You ought to volunteer for the nursery, become a nursery worker, and then you can see in a whole room. We have tons of babies, overflowing babies downstairs, and you can see that a mother can distinguish the cry of her own baby. Paul says that we have come of age. He says we have been adopted as adult children into the full rights of sonship, and yet the spirit of the son in our hearts still creates a distinctive cry that is childlike in its dependence on our father and the father's ear is attuned to that cry he can hear us cry from very far away he can distinguish our cry from all the other cries on earth John said, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, that we'll have what we asked of him. Hebrews says, let us approach God's throne with confidence that we might find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus said, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I'm telling you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask Him directly in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father Himself loves you because you have loved me and believed I came from God. One final thing about Abba. Abba is a cry of urgent desperation. Funny, but Paul isn't the only one who dropped the Aramaic word Abba into a Greek letter. Mark did the very same thing when he was writing his gospel in chapter 14, verse 36. Abba was Jesus' cry in the garden on the night he was handed over. 
Abba was Jesus' cry in his most difficult hour when the weight of the whole world was upon him. Abba was Jesus' cry in the midst of deep sorrow. Abba was his cry to the Father in the midst of unbearable anxiety and stress. Abba was Jesus' cry in the midst of physical suffering. Abba was his cry to the Father when his closest friends were indifferent to his hour of need, when no one was there to help him. Abba was Jesus' cry all alone in the darkness. Abba was Jesus' cry in the face of cruel betrayal. Abba was Jesus' cry, uh, cry on his way to trial. Abba was Jesus' cry in the face of impending loss. Abba was Jesus' cry in the face of death itself. Can I tell you that in the most difficult hour of your life, you have a cry too. Abba, in the midst of your deepest sorrow. Abba, in the midst of your suffering. Abba, in the midst of anxiety and stress. Abba, in the midst of devastating loss. Abba, when you've lost your job. Abba, when you're on your way to court. Abba, in the midst of loneliness. Abba, when no one else on earth understands, when no one else on earth can help you. Abba, when your friends have let you down. Abba, in the face of betrayal. Abba, in the midst of divorce. Abba, when your kids are a mess. Abba, when your father and mother forsake you, God will hold you. Abba in the midst of sickness. Abba in the face of cancer. Abba in the face of death itself. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him. And I will show him my salvation. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach good news. You have a Father. He's not occupied. He's not aloof. He's not angry. He's not abusive. He's not far away. He's right here in your heart. Come on, get on your feet and give some glory to your wonderful Father. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Happy Father's Day, Harvest Time. You have a father. He knows my name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, lift up your faces to heaven. Lift up your hands to heaven. Come on, let's begin to make a cry of informal intimacy. Let's begin to make a cry of informal intimacy to the Father right now. Come on, use the word of Jesus. Use the prayer language of the early church and address him as Abba. Come on, would you begin to just call him Abba? Abba, Father. Come on, I, I can pray about you but I can't pray for you. Only you can use your lips. Only you can move your mouth and use your vocal cords. Would you pray to Abba right now? Come on, Abba, we love you. Abba, we magnify you. Abba, we worship you. Abba, we lift you up. Abba, we thank you that you're so good. Abba, we thank you that you're so kind. Abba, we thank you that you're so merciful, that you're so gracious. Abba, we thank you that you're a good dad. Abba, we thank you that you're not angry, that you're not abusive, that you're not aloof. Abba, we thank you that you're engaged, 
that you're involved, that you care, that you see, that you hear. Abba, we thank you. Come on, church. Call out to him. Abba, Abba, Father. Abba, we lift our voice to you. Abba, we worship you. We love you. Abba, we magnify you. Abba, come on. Let's make a, a cry of childlike dependence on Abba today. Would you tell Abba you trust him? Would you tell Abba that you know his way is best? Come on. Abba, we trust you. Abba, we know your way is best. Abba, we know that you're working all things together for our good. The things we don't understand, the things that cause us pain, the things that have set us back. Abba, we trust you. Abba, we trust your hand. Abba, we trust your faithfulness. Abba, we trust your goodness. Abba, we trust you. Come on, maybe you need to make a cry of urgent desperation today. Maybe there's a situation in your life and you need Abba to come and invade it right now. Maybe you need his help in your marriage. Maybe you need his help with your kids. Maybe you need his help with your grandkids. Maybe you need his help with your career, with your finances. Maybe you need a healing. Come on, would you make an urgent cry of, of desperation to Abba this morning? Lift up your voice and cry out to him. Your father's listening. His ear is turned your way. Abba, we cry cry out to you. Abba, we need you. Abba, we're crying out. We thank you, Abba, that you hear us. Abba, we need your help. Abba, we need your healing. Abba, nothing is impossible for you. Abba, nothing's too hard for you. Abba, nothing is uh, too difficult for you. Abba, we need your healing in our bodies. Abba, we need your healing in our homes. Abba, we need your healing in our marriages. Abba, we need your help with our kids. Abba, we need your help with our grandkids. Abba, we need your help in our careers and our finances. Abba, we need your help in court. Abba, we need your help. Lord, we need you to intervene, Abba, in our friendships. Lord, we need your direction. We need your wisdom, Abba. We need you. Come on, church. Abba, Father. Just take that beautiful name on your lips and just use it to worship right now. Abba, we worship you. Abba, we praise you. Abba, we love you. Abba, we magnify you. Would you take your hands? This is just symbolic, but would you take your hands and just put them on your forehead right now? Abba, right now I ask in Jesus' name that you would break any perceptions, any prejudices against God the Father that we've held, Lord, in our immaturity. Any prejudices, any perceptions, Lord, based on a broken relationship with our own Father, based on religious tradition from our past, Abba, any prejudice or perception that we had of you as angry, as aloof, as abusive, as unjust, Abba, we pray that you just break that mindset right now in Jesus' name. Abba, send the spirit of your Son into our hearts, Abba to just communicate the goodness of the Father. Abba, we see you clearly today, kind and loving, good, gentle and caring and going to such great lengths, Abba, to bring us to yourself. Abba, we pray that you just transform our minds by the renewing of the Holy Spirit right now. Abba, we pray that any mindset that has hindered our relationship with you, our connection to you, that has made it difficult to relate to our Father in heaven, I pray, Father, you you just break that off of your people right now in Jesus' name. Father, I pray, keep your hand right there in Jesus' name, that you would just break any religious spirit off of your people, Father. Lord, that has made serving Christ a duty, a burden, an obligation, any religious spirit that gives pressure to perform, any religious spirit that gives pressure to do rituals or to do the things of Christ, uh, but doing them as rituals, Lord, any pressure, Lord, any any, any uh, anxiety, Lord, that we're not good enough, that we don't measure up, that uh, we have to do more, that we're not doing it correctly. Father, I pray that you'd break that religious spirit, Lord. We are no longer slaves, but we are free sons. We are no longer slaves, but we are free sons. We are no longer slaves to religion. Father, in Jesus' name, break Jewish religion off your people. Father, in Jesus' name, break lifeless Christian religion off of your people. Break Hindu 
Hindu religion off of your people. Break Muslim religion off of your people. Break Buddhist religion off of your people. Break animistic religion off of your people. In Jesus' name, Lord, break the religious spirit. In Jesus' name, we are not slaves. We are free sons. Come on, I want you to just say that. I am not a slave. Oh, come on, you need to do better. I am not a slave. I am a free son. I am not a slave. I am a son and an heir through God. Come on, give him a great big praise in this place today. Just before we go, there's one more cry of desperation in my heart. And I need you to share it with me. And I need it to become yours. We've been working on phase two. That's our new sanctuary since 1998. 17 years we've been working on our new building, buying this property, building the first half of this building. It's time to build phase two. We must begin now. Guys, look around. There is no room in this room for any more people. There were people who couldn't have seats in the back. There are people who wanted to sit in the back. They got on the front row because there were no seats left in the back. We need phase two. Our church family needs phase two. We have to start phase two now because the zoning approvals that we got in 2008 expire at the end of the winter. By the end of the winter, the foundation of the new building has to be in or we lose the zoning approvals. And under the new zoning laws, what we have built here right now is already too much. The building we have, the parking lots we have, it already exceeds the new standards of the new zoning regulations. So we have to have the foundation in by the end of winter, which means we have to start immediately on phase two. And we need God's help. We don't have enough money. We need cash. We're working on financing right now. We have the ability to borrow from our denomination, the Assemblies of God, uh, which we'll do. But even then, we need money to start the building. I want to say that on our own, even collectively, it's bigger than us. But it's not too big for our great God. Nothing's impossible with Him. My dad moved out of our house on my 16th birthday. I remember standing in my upstairs window, watching him go. And I said, God, what are we going to do now? And God spoke to me in that moment. Promise from the Psalms, words of David. When your father and your mother forsake you, I will hold you. I want to tell you that my heavenly father has held me every day since I was eight years old. He has never once failed me. He's stressed me out a few times, but he has never once failed me. So I need you to make a cry of desperation to Abba with me today. I need you to lift up your voices. I need you to help me because I've cried about as much as I can cry. So I need you to share this. Listen, I need you to take this last week of fasting and prayer seriously. Please, would you, would you set aside a day or two or three, skip a meal, skip a few meals. A few of us could skip a few days of meals. We'd be okay. Freeze the dumb maple bacon, whatever, whatever. Freeze them. They'll, they'll taste maple bacon a week from now. And fast and pray with me. I need you to walk the line. This was a really bad week, this last week for prayer walking. I, I was almost going to throw away the plans for phase two and build an ark this last week. But the weather's good now. Walk that line. Prayer walk the perimeter of phase two and pray. And let's believe God to do the impossible for us. Come on, would you lift up your voice? You lift up your voices. Would you cry to Abba with me? And let's pray that Abba will come. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Nothing's too difficult for him. Terry, I want to ask you to come. Terry Kelly, come. And I want you to just lead us. Come on, everybody, lift up your voice. Come on, you make your cry. And let's make a cry of faith to Abba right now. An urgent cry. Come on, you lift up your voice and agree as Terry prays. Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Father, that you already have the plans. They are safe within your hands, Lord, but you have called us, God, your children, Abba, to come and to partner with you. Stakes and to stretch out. It is you that called us to 
have a bigger tent, Lord God, because you know that there are others, others in this region, Lord, who need to learn how to call upon you as Abba. So Abba, we ask you now to give us the breakthrough. We ask you now to give us the provision. We ask you now to give us what is required, Lord God, so that others can know you the way that you've allowed us to know you as Abba, to look into your face, Lord God, to look into your face with love and not terror. So Father, give us the breakthrough, Abba. Lead us, lead us, lead us into the next phases that you have for us, Lord. We ask you for all the provision. We ask you for all the divine appointments.